Good morning. Welcome to this service of worship with the First Presbyterian Church of Highland, Indiana. We are so glad that you are here in this space with us to give glory to God together with us. Today we will be hearing about Jesus as the deliverer, as the rebuker of demons, as the one who can make us whole, as the one who empowers us to also do the work of deliverance in this broken world that is in need of healing. So in preparation for learning about this Jesus and for giving glory to God, I invite you to make your sacred space ready and to breathe in the Holy Spirit. Now, let us worship God. Welcome to worship with First Presbyterian Church in Highland. We have a few announcements before we dive into worshiping. Our annual congregational meeting is today, January 31st at 11.45 a.m. This will be held on Zoom. If you need the Zoom link or phone number, you can contact Pastor Tyler. Bring Your Own Bible virtual study is still going on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. If you'd like to join in and do not have the login information, please contact Heather Cassiano. Virtual fellowship will return next Sunday after the worship service on Zoom, which will be provided in the email. Offering envelopes for 2021 are available in the church office if you haven't picked yours up yet. And the youth are going to be collecting canned goods and money for this year's Super Bowl event. Watch for details in an email or the larger view. Christ's peace is with us always, no matter where we may be. And so, Christ's peace is with us each and every one this moment. Let us take it in and really feel it. 
When we are done with worship today, call somebody from the church and greet them with Christ's peace. Let's bring our voices together in the call to worship. Praise the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with our whole hearts in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is the Lord's work, whose righteousness endures forever. The Lord has gained renown with wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. The Lord provides food for those who fear God. The Lord is ever mindful of the covenant. The Lord has shown the, us people the power of the Lord's works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of the Lord's hands are faithful and just. All the Lord's precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. The Lord sent redemption to us people. The Lord has commanded the covenant forever. Holy and awesome is the name of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. The Lord's praise endures forever. Let us praise the Lord. Our opening hymn today is Arise, Your Light Has Come, number 411. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by God. Let us confess our sins together, for there is much that we have done and failed to do in our arrogance of thinking that we know best. Let's join together in the prayer of confession. Dear God, grant us humility as we confess our sins unto you. We confess that we have demons within our society and within ourselves that need to be rebuked. Demons of hatred and violence plague the world and infest our souls. Demons of fear drive our actions and inaction. Demons of arrogance and ignorance lead us to make harmful assumptions about each other and about the world. Forgive us for keeping these demons with us. 
Deliver us, O God, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, the rebuker of demons, we pray. Amen. For us, there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. Our God is a God of grace. Our Lord is a Lord of forgiveness. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Hallelujah! Thanks be to God! Now let's join together in our statement of faith, which comes from a brief statement of faith. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, whom alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives, teaching by word and deed and blessing the children, healing the sick and binding up the brokenhearted, eating with the outcasts, forgiving sinners and calling all to repent and believe the gospel. And now let's join together in the prayer for illumination. O Lord, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth in love and faith and strength to follow on the path you set before us. Through Jesus Christ, the rebuker of demons, we pray. Amen. Our Hebrew Bible lesson today comes from the book of Jonah, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, Yes, 
angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush, for which you did not labor, and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night, and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? This is the word of God. Our epistle lesson is from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 8, verses 1 to 6. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. And our Gospel reading is from Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, Who is this? What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here in our homes and in our hearts. Guide us by your wisdom as we listen for your word. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, the rebuker of demons, we pray. Amen. Today's sermon is entitled, Signed, Sealed, and Delivered. Jesus and the disciples who had just dropped everything at the drop of a drachma to follow this man of the possibility of new creation continued along the Sea of Galilee to the bustling town of Capernaum on the very northern shore. And on the Sabbath day, Jesus entered the local synagogue. Now, it's important to remember the context of Jesus' life up to this point. At his birth, he had been heralded by angels, adored by shepherds, recognized by foreign dignitaries, and feared by a king. After his family fled to Egypt as refugees, and then returned to Palestine, though, he grew up in relative obscurity, 
out in that much maligned little village of Nazareth. In Luke, we learn about his time in the temple in Jerusalem as a 12-year-old asking questions of the rabbis. Beyond that little story, however, there is nothing recorded until his baptism. We can guess that that means he went through his childhood, adolescence, and young adulthood like most of us, moving through the stages of development and learning what it means to be human in community with other humans. Many people believe he was even laboring in the carpentry trade along with his earthly father, Joseph. Whatever he was doing, we don't know much about it. And we can assume that the people outside of Nazareth at that time didn't know much about him either. So, when he walked into that synagogue in Capernaum, those gathered round must have seen him as a random person with no authority whatsoever to teach them. In their eyes, he was an unknown nobody from the middle of nowhere. They probably didn't even notice his presence until he made his way to the front. But then he began to teach. We don't know what exactly he taught or how exactly he taught it, but he clearly taught in a way that they were not used to and with a gravitas that impressed them. Since the Gospel makes it a point to point out that Jesus did not teach as the scribes taught, we can guess that his style and message were striking. So striking were they that the people were astounded. But that was only the beginning of this unknown nobody from nowhere transforming into a known somebody from somewhere. For whatever it was that Jesus taught, and however it was that Jesus taught, it was so significant a message spoken with such authority that it stirred up and frightened the powers of evil. And so, an unclean spirit that is a demon that was possessing a man in the synagogue cried out, now wait just a minute. Demons? Unclean spirits? Powers of evil? Are we even allowed to talk about these things in a Presbyterian church? I certainly never learned about them when I was growing up. In all of my many years of going to church, of going to church school, of going to church camp, I can probably count on one hand the number of times I heard about demons in the context of mainline Protestantism in the United States. Why is this? Well, I think there are a few reasons. In our rationality, we find it hard to acknowledge spiritual beings. In our spirituality, we find it scary to acknowledge forces of evil. And perhaps the most powerful driver for our context in our niceness 
We find it improper to acknowledge even the existence of evil. I get it. It's much easier, safer, and more palatable to rationalize them out of existence, to close our eyes in fear and pretend that they simply do not exist, or to nicely and properly sweep their existence under the rug. Although there are many problems with these approaches, let's focus on one primary problem. Jesus acknowledged and confronted evil head on. Demons and representatives of evil populated the world of Jesus and seemed to pop up wherever he went. They couldn't keep quiet around this being of pure love, and so they responded violently, crying out and often causing whomever they possessed to convulse or to fall to the ground or to attack. In the case of the synagogue, in Capernaum, from today's Gospel reading, the unclean spirit cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Well, the worshipers at the synagogue hopefully had some knowledge of who this teacher was now. And it took a demon to reveal this knowledge. It makes me wonder how often we also are willfully ignorant of God's presence, just like we are so willfully ignorant of the presence of evil. I wonder how often we also are so desensitized to love and joy and goodness that it takes the presence of evil to wake us up to the presence of God. Anyway, I digress. When the unclean spirit cried out, Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying with a loud voice came out of him. According to Mark, that was Jesus' very first miracle, the exorcism of a demon. He would go on to perform physical miracles, healing sicknesses and injuries, multiplying food, walking on water, and even bringing the dead back to life. But his very first was a spiritual deliverance. He exorcised a demon. And in doing so, he liberated a human being's soul. I think we should really take the time to reflect on that. For a very good reason, our churches today are focused on the physical needs of people. In beautiful Matthew 25 fashion, we are dedicated to the work of providing food where there is hunger, water where there is thirst, clothing where there is nakedness, shelter where there is homelessness, medicine where there is sickness, 
and visitation and representation where there is incarceration. This work is absolutely necessary, and we must never falter in our commitment to it, as seen in his other miracles and in his ministry as a whole, Jesus also was very committed to what I will call physical salvation. But then there was also that very first miracle, that act of soul liberation, that act of spiritual liberation. When I look at the world today, I see very visible physical brokenness. Entrenched poverty, unending violence, mass displacement of peoples, pandemic sickness, and a rapidly changing climate. And then when I look deeper, I see spiritual brokenness underneath it all. I discern demons dwelling and lurking in our midst. For what else besides demons and resulting spiritual brokenness can explain all of the fear and hatred and violence that plague our societies and infest our souls. In this week of Holocaust remembrance, on this eve of Black History Month, as we stand upon land stolen through machinations of genocide, what word besides evil can describe ideologies of Christian nationalism, white supremacy, and settler colonialism. As a virus overruns the world, what word besides evil can describe ideology, can describe the disparities upon which our healthcare systems are built? the inequalities upon which our economic systems thrive, and the justifications upon which policies of resource withholding are founded. As wars rage on, what word besides evil can describe weapons of mass destruction and nuclear weapons and chemical weapons and personal weapons? As the planet warms and famine increases and water depletes and habitats collapse and entire species blink out of existence, what word besides evil can describe our extraction and pollution and consumption and economics of unlimited growth? And what better framework then demon possession is there to understand our collective participation in these systems, these ideologies, and these actions. What better framework than demon possession is there to understand how people whom we know to be kind and loving and generous of spirit can transform into being people who spew hateful words and support hateful policies and allow their souls to be consumed by the bitterness of perceived grievance. What better framework than demon possession is there to understand how fellow human beings can value material property over human life? material security over human connection, and material accumulation over shared human thriving. What better framework than demon possession is there to understand how we can look at a child crossing a border and see only a threat? 
or look at a child crossing a street and see only a threat, or look at a child across the world and see only a threat. Yes, loved ones, demons are indeed dwelling and lurking in our midst. They have last names like supremacy and phobia and ism and archy. They possess people we have never met. They possess people we know and love. They possess our very selves. They possess entire societies. They infest our souls. They break our spirits. But, oh my friends, my friends indeed, let us take heart. Let us have hope. Let us rejoice, for there is good news. For Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. We have a Messiah who has power over demons, who rebukes them and casts them out. And although that Messiah is certainly concerned with defeating demons, that Messiah is even more concerned with saving us beloved children of God who are possessed. That Messiah delivers us, liberates our souls, and heals our spirits into wholeness. And we have within us a Holy Spirit whose love is greater than any demon or force of evil could ever hope to be. The Holy Spirit has set a seal upon our hearts that cannot be broken, no matter how many demons may be chipping away at us. And we have watching over us a Creator God who continually offers us new creation, who is bigger than any evil that ever was or ever will be and who sets a sign within the skies and within our very souls to remind us that we belong to them. So there it is, signed, sealed, delivered, we are theirs. And my friends, I have even more good news. You see, in my experiences worshiping God in churches outside of the United States, I have learned that because we are signed, sealed, and delivered, we also are empowered to rebuke and cast out the demons that plague our societies and infest our souls. We are empowered. So let us commit to the hard but miraculous work of seeking them out, recognizing them, naming them, rebuking them, and casting them out in Jesus' name. And let us commit to the even harder and even more miraculous work of seeking out the good in each other, of recognizing the Holy Spirit in each other, of naming the humanity in each other, of building each other up, and so of healing each other into wholeness.
Dear God, here we are. Signed, sealed, delivered, we're yours. Amen. Let us pray. God, you are our great deliverer. You are bigger and more powerful than the demons that possess us. In your love, no evil can survive. Signed, sealed, and delivered, we pray that you will continue to rebuke and cast out the forces of evil that plague this world and infest our souls. And we pray that you will heal and make whole those who are most harmed by our societal demons. We pray for people displaced by our demons of poverty and violence. We pray for migrants making their way across the world. We pray for refugees seeking safety. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for communities of the innocent who are suffering because of our demons of fear and hatred. We pray for communities who are harmed by our weapons and by our words. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are sick and dying because of our demons of disparity and indifference. We pray for those who are in hospital beds and those who are denied access to hospital beds. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for fellow human beings who are isolated and lonely because of our demons of pride and independence. We pray for fellow human beings lonely at home and in nursing homes and in prisons and in the streets. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for our loved ones, and we pray for ourselves. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Now let us join our hearts and voices with the faithful across the world, praying the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us in whatever language is nearest to our hearts. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Listen to our invitation to the offering. Just as Jesus had the power to deliver the man in the temple from the demon that possessed him, we are empowered to deliver our society from its many demons. Let us give our tithes and offerings so that we can do the work of deliverance. I encourage you to mail in checks or take advantage of our online giving options through our website. Now let us take a moment to reflect on stewardship. using the words in the prayer of dedication. Dear God, you deliver us every day. We dedicate our material resources to you so that we might bring spiritual healing to a broken and breaking world. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, the rebuker of demons, we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is Take My Life, number 391.
Friends, as we stay in this day, let us not shrink away from the demons that are there in this world. Instead, let us remember that we are empowered to rebuke them and to deliver each other, and so to heal each other and build each other up. Let us commit to this hard but necessary work. We stay in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the rebuker of demons, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen.